Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new here, hello! My name is Caitlin Elliott, and I cover true crime cases on Tuesdays and Fridays, with my more vintage cases being on Fridays. If you enjoy true crime videos, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, hit that notification bell so that you never miss any of my videos. And in my last video, we did talk about the Sandy Hook shooting. And today, I'm going to be covering the case of Lizzie Borden. This case is extremely infamous, and I'm talking about like anybody who's anybody has heard about the case of Lizzie Borden. It's been covered on YouTube channels, it's been on Ghost Adventures, it's been on a lot of shows on the Travel Channel. Everybody knows about Lizzie Borden, which this case at one point was actually dubbed the most famous case in the New England area, which is extremely crazy in my opinion. So there is actually a nursery rhyme that was said during this time. It was Lizzie Borden took an ax, gave her father 40, no, yeah, gave her mother 40 wax. When she seen what she had done, she gave her father 41. Now, is this the truth? Did she actually take an axe and bludgeon her family 40 and 41 times? Did she lose her mind and just kill her entire family? Or was there actually a more deeper mystery behind the story? So, when Lizzie was just a young girl, her mother named Sarah ended up passing away and getting ill after she gave birth to a child. And this child was Lizzie. Andrew and Lizzie took her death pretty hard, but soon Andrew met a young woman named Abby, well Abigail, and she went by the name of Abby, and he soon ended up falling in love with her and marrying her. So this case takes place in the late 1800s in Fall River, Massachusetts, in the year of 1892 to be precise, and Fall River is only 50 miles away from Boston, the capital of Massachusetts. So during this time, it was said that about 70,000 people were living there due, due to a very booming textile mill that was in the area that provided a lot of people with jobs. A lot of the families that moved here to find work, it was said that they were all of the Catholic religion, as most Catholic families do have a lot of children. Lizzie Andrew Borden was born on July 19th of 19, 1860, which is said to have been the start of the Civil War. She was said to be the youngest daughter of Andrew and Sarah Borden with two older sisters named Emma Leonora Borden and Alice Sarah Borden, with Alice passing away at the age of two and Sarah was said to have died not long after Lizzie was born. This meant young Lizzie and her elder sister named Emma, who was 10 to 12 years older than Lizzie, had to be raised by her fa their father named Andrew. Andrew Borden was said to have been extremely well off during this time period. He was said to have not spent any of his money despite how wealthy he truly was and he raised his children to be very humble about how wealthy they were. The Borden family home was said to have had no electricity, plumbing, or bathrooms and this was said to have been extremely uncommon during that time period as a lot of homes did in fact have plumbing and electricity. He ended up purchasing a home in 1873 that would become one of the most famous homes in the New England area. It said that he planned to split the home in half to rent this part out to boarders so that he could end up with an extra income. He wasn't exactly the nicest guy in the world and he would overtax his tenants by an astronomical amount so that he could get even more money. He would. Uh, Andrew Borden, he was born and raised in the 1840s and he grew up extremely poor, having to constantly work his, and he had to work and work since he was a child. And he continued acting this way like they were, everyone was still poor, even in the year of 1892 when he was said to have been extremely wealthy. After Lizzie grew up in, from high school, grew up from high school, graduated from high school, sorry, she provided Andrew with her class ring. He was extremely proud of her and ended up wearing that ring every single day into his violent and brutal death. After Sarah Borden passed on, Andrew remarried a woman named Abigail Duffy Gray, also known to her friends as Abby. She was said to have entered their lives when Lizzie was only five years old and Emma, her sister, was said to have been around 14. Lizzie was said to have been only two or three years old when her mother passed away, so she wouldn't really have remembered her, and it was assumed that Abby may have possibly had been a gold digger going after Andrew for his money. However, these claims could not be proven factually, as it is just a speculation. Abby really took a stern 
hold and grip and control of the household when she moved in, forcing the sisters to have as many chores as they could. And the girls, as they were, as the girls were growing up, they ended up becoming very resentful and furious towards Abby. Both Lizzie and Emma were said to have never married, and in the year of 1892, Lizzie was 32 and Emma was 42. It, during this time period, it was extremely uncommon for women to not be married by the age of 30, so people did talk about this around town. It was said that the sisters were supposed to inherit the family fortune, which could have been which could have created a hatred towards Abby Borden as they believed that if Andrew was to pass away, Abby would get the money. So Andrew ends up buying a house which might, may have been for Abby's family, also known as his in-laws, but it was unclear as to why a house was bought even though it was. Lizzie and Emma were extremely upset about this purchase because they wanted to know why Andrew would buy a home for his in-laws but not for his two daughters. It was said that at the it was also said that the home that he bought was said to have been in the richest was not in the richest part of town and was said to have been easily afforded by Andrew and they were just furious with him that he would buy something in the poor area. Lizzie and her sister Emma demanded to buy one of Andrew's properties for a dollar, like a freaking dollar bill for them to live in. And he actually agreed to this. He said, okay, and ended up selling one of his properties to his daughters for a dollar. Five years later, the sisters ended up selling this insane property back to Andrew for a total of $5,000, like... He sold it to them for a dollar, but he bought it back for five thousand. Like that just does not make any sense. And at that time, five thousand dollars was worth about a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in today's time. Around this time, Lizzie refused to st to continue calling her stepmother Abby mother, and she just called her that woman. I mean, I just find it extremely disrespectful as someone who raised you since you were two years old. Well, five years old. Sorry, five years old. And did, and you just start calling her that woman. It, oh my god. It just blows my mind. Lizzie claimed that due to opinion differences, she refused to continue calling her stepmother mother anymore, which had to have been a slap in the face for her stepmother, Abby. She then decided to travel with some local female friends that she had to Europe. And this was obviously paid for by Andrew Borden. And this was the first time that she ever really truly left Fall River, Massachusetts. Once Lizzie ret returned home from her trip, however, this is when things in the home really started to take a dark turn. In June of 19 1891, I'm, I'm just dyslexic with numbers or something. Someone, and it's still unclear of who could have this could have been at the time, ended up breaking into the Borden family home and robbing them. So they stole jewelry and they stole money. And for some reason, they took a whole bunch of like these train car tickets. And it's just bizarre. During this time, no one ever really locked their doors or their windows, which is something I did discuss in the Velisca Axe Murders video about how, you know, they would just leave the doors unlocked for neighbors to come in anytime they want and say hi to the families that live there. So after the robbery, Andrew Borden was said to have just started locking all of his doors and his windows, becoming increasingly paranoid that someone was out to get him and something bad would happen. Despite being paranoid about his safety, he would leave the bedroom key in plain sight. Which, if Andrew was so worried about being robbed, why would he leave the bedroom that key right there so anyone can just take it, unlock it, and kill him? It just doesn't make any sense. It was also said that Lizzie had stolen a lot of stuff from local shops, and Andrew would, you know, feel so embarrassed because they would let him know, hey, your daughter stole from us again. And he would go over and basically pay them off to keep their mouths shut. The, so it's possible at this time that Lizzie may have been, in fact, a kleptomaniac. And a kleptomaniac, in case you didn't know, a lot of people have this impulse to take stuff. And sometimes when they, you know, they steal, they don't really realize that they had actually stolen. They don't comprehend that they did it until after 
they see this item with them they're like where did I get this from and it's possible that you know they uh, pay, he paid them off so that the family wouldn't be embarrassed and the reputation wouldn't be soiled so in other words people who have kleptomania they cannot control their tendencies and mental health was said to it was frowned upon heavily back then and actually covered a video on the dark history of mental asylums and I can link that down below but like I said it was frowned upon back then especially if you are in fact a wealthy person but of course you know this isn't said to have been factual it's just a theory Lizzie Borden was said to have absolutely adored animals it's said that when she died she actually donated all of her wealth to local charities in the area the Borden family, they also owned a barn along with other vast properties that house mo um, multiple pigeons inside. It was said that Andrew entered the barn one day with an axe and he was just pissed off at all these pigeons inside. And he took a hatchet and just started hacking these poor birds to death. And he ended up bringing their deca these decapitated bodies back into their home and set it there for Lizzie to see and it's just like oh my god why would you do that so after all this happened the atmosphere in the Borden household was said to be extremely dark and tense in August of 1892 everyone in the Borden household became just violently sick with some type of food poisoning or stomach virus no one really thought anything of this except for Abby Borden, who feared that they were all being poisoned by some unknown person's hatred of Andrew Borden. Andrew was said to have had a lot of envious business rivals who didn't like the fact that he was getting, like, becoming wealthy in society, becoming well known. And he had a lot of people who did, just did not like him at all, and she worried that these rivals were trying to kill them. However, this would later prove to be nothing more than food poisoning. And please remember this fact that it was food poisoning because this will become important later in the video. It was popular during this time to eat leftovers over a long period of time to ration food. And the mutton that they had, the Borden family had been eating that day was cooked almost three weeks prior. Yeah, absolutely disgusting. So, everyone in that house had been sick with food poisoning except for Bridget, who had been the one that cooked the meal for the families. Mutton, for those who don't know, is considered the flesh of an old sheep that is cooked for stews and meals. The day before the murders, Lizzie's uncle was said to have come into the town to visit the family. His name was John Morse. So John was the brother of Sarah, who was the mother of Lizzie and deceased former wife of Andrew Borden. It's a brother of Sarah, ex-wife of, well, deceased wife of Andrew Borden and the mother of Lizzie and her older sister, Emma. So John arrived on August 2nd of 1892 at the Borden home before showing up at dinner at 9 p.m. Lizzie had been out with a friend that day and when she came home she didn't even stop to say hello to her family. At 10 p.m. that same night the gentlemen finished their conversations together and they went to bed as Lizzie was still up with her out with her friend named Alice who lived close to the home. Her friend named Alice noticed that like Lizzie seemed extremely on edge, extremely tense, scared, jumpy, and agitated as if she knew something bad was going to happen and she was just waiting for it to occur. Lizzie confides to Alice that her entire family had been sick with some type of food poisoning and she feared that they were all being poisoned. She personally believed that the person behind the poisonings were business Andrew's business rivals and that it was said that one night she saw very strange people just lurking outside of their family home. Lizzie became extremely terrified that someone was going to come into their house and burn it down while they were all sleeping. On August 4th of 1892, there was something that would happen that would go down in the country's history as one of the most infamous tragedies in the world. 
At 6 a.m. that morning, a family maid, the family maid named Bridget Sullivan woke up and started her duties for the day. She was said to have worked for the Borden family for many, 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 many years. And she was known as Maggie because this was the name of their previous maid and Lizzie didn't bother wanting to know what the other, the new maid's name was going to be so she just continued calling her Maggie. She performed a lot of the household chores like washing the clothes, cleaning the dishes, cooking for the family, sweeping and doing the shopping, just doing everything that, you know, that they could do but they didn't want to. When Lizzie and Emma were at the house, it said that they still had chores that they had to do. Andrew and Abby came downstairs that morning to fix their breakfast and they both fixed a bowl of leftover mutton that was left on the stove. And Bridget was said to have woken up at on August 4th of 1892 just feeling very nauseous and headachy, just profusely vomiting just everywhere she could. She just bleh, bleh. So that was extremely suspicious. Oddly enough, on that same morning, no one had heard a thing from Lizzie and she wasn't even home at the time. At 9 a.m., Abby told the maid Bridget to go and wash the clothes and the windows of the home and the maid ended up telling Lizzie, you know, don't lock the door because I will be right back in. And she wanted to easily get, go and get fresh water to wash the windows with. Andrew was said to have not been home at the time that morning and decided he was going to go out for a walk to enjoy the fresh air. At 10 a.m. that morning, the door was said to have been locked, which was extremely unusual. So he knocked until Bridget ended up letting him inside. As Bridget started to struggle to get the lock open, she started hearing Lizzie just laugh. And she spins around to see Lizzie standing on top of the staircase, just laughing maniacally, like, hee hee hee, you know, just like losing her shit. When Andrew enters the home, he asks Lizzie where Abby was as he couldn't find his wife anywhere. His daughter claimed to find a note that stated it was from one of Abby's friends that had been ill. However, there was never any note found and it's possible she had just been lying at the time, just BS the whole thing. Andrew starts to just lean back and casually, casually relax on his sofa and he put his slippers on before going to sleep. Bridget and Lizzie, they chatted for a while before... She went upstairs and Lizzie snapped at her to just go to the local department store to go pick her something up. And around 11 a.m. that morning, she is heard screaming, Maggie, Maggie, come quick. Father's dead. Bridget, she just rushes downstairs because she's like, oh my God, what do you mean she's dead? And they discovered that Andrew had, in fact, been deceased. In fact, he wasn't just deceased. He had been bludgeoned to death with what, with what had seemed to them at the time to be from an axe. It was said by the autopsy done by the medical examiner that Andrew had actually been hit 10 or 11 times. Lizzie then tells Bridget to run and fetch the local doctor, but when she finds out the doctor isn't home, she tells her um, maid Bridget to go and fetch her friend named Alice that she had been with the other night. As the maid comes back to, and returns home with Alice, the women start discussing what they should do and that they should get a hold of the local police so, as they're getting a hold of the local police, Alice goes out and starts informing the neighbors of the death of the Bordens. Because the Bordens actually, the family lived a very simple lifestyle. They did not have a phone in their house, so they had to get a hold of someone to actually let them use their phone so they could place the call. The police managed to arrive very quickly to their home since the police station was only a few yards away from the Borden home. With Officer George... The uh, officer that arrived, his name was George Allen, and he was said to have been the very first person to arrive on the scene. Officer Allen then entered the home and was shocked to indeed find the deceased bodies of Andrew Borden and Abigail Borden in the home. Andrew was found in the family room, just laying on the lounge sofa that he had been staying on, with his face turned upwards towards the ceiling. As Dr. Bowen was leaving... Um, Officer Allen, he arrived back at the station to report the murders that had occurred. Dr. Bowen was originally told by Lizzie that Andrew and Abby Borden had been stabbed to death. But upon inspection, it realized they realized that um, these were not from stab these are not stab wounds. They have to be from something else. So the, uh, Lizzie said, like I said, claimed that they had been stabbed, but the officers believed that 
some type of other weapon had been used. Bridget the maid then arrives back home and ultimately covers up the bodies with sheets so, you know, the faces are protected. Lizzie asked the doctors if he could send a telegram to her sister Emma about the murders and let them know let her know what had happened. And the authorities start to ask Lizzie where her mother Abby was. She begins to tell them about the note that she had found earlier about her stepmother's friend before telling Bridget to find their neighbor named Mrs. Churchill. Shortly after Abby's body was found face down in the guest room, shortly afterwards, Abby's body was found laying face down in the family's guest room floor. And it was ultimately ended up being noticed by authorities as they're walking up the stairs and do do do, and they just see her body laying there. John Morse, the uncle, had been said to have been staying in the, the guest room, and he didn't even realize that this was going on. And Abby's body was said to have been found in the guest room, so it's super weird. It's possible that she was actually attacked by whoever killed them while she was cleaning this be guest bedroom. And it's possible the killer had entered the room, snuck up on her, and just started, you know, going at it. Abby was then ultimately attacked with a hatchet upon the side of her head. It was said by the police that it's possible that when Abby had been killed, that she had been looking directly at her killer when she tripped and ended up falling right before the killer had attacked her with a hatchet upon the side of her head. Abby was said to have been hacked 19 times with a hatchet, dying only 90 minutes before Andrew did. So Abby had been killed first, and then Andrew was killed. The police marshal claimed that Andrew Borden was dead in the lounge with his head just bludgeoned. When searching the home for any type of forensic evidence that they could find at the time, they discussed... They discovered a Lizzie. Lizzie had been alive in her bedroom, so they asked her if she knew anything about the murders that had occurred and why exactly they could have happened. She claimed she only knew that Andrew came home between 10.30 and 10.45 that morning, and she had just urged her father to lie down and take a little nap on the sofa, so he happily did so. She told authorities that she was in the barn on their property at the time of the murders. Lizzie loved being inside the barn, and she would hang out there every day with her little pigeon friends. Because of what Lizzie claimed that she was doing, it did not place her inside the household at the time of the murders. Lizzie had been outside for a half an hour that day with her little bird friends before coming back inside, and this was when she noticed the maid named Bridget upstairs. Lizzie then entered the living room and just started screaming on top of her lungs when she had discovered her father, Andrew Borden, lying there deceased. Lizzie called Bridget to come downstairs before calling the police, and they asked her if she noticed anything strange from that day. For which Lizzie replied, you know, I didn't really see anything bizarre that day. Authorities then asked her who John Morse could have been, and Lizzie replied that that was her uncle. He had left the Borden household at 9 a.m. that morning, and it's unclear of what he was doing, not returning home until police had arrived. So he left the home at 9 a.m., came back after police had already been there. John Morris was said to have no idea about what had happened with the murders, and he could have been telling the truth, or he could have just be, been BSing. We really just don't know at this point. Police asked Lizzie who could have done something like this, and she stated that two days prior to the murders, a man actually called Andrew about opening a shop, and Andrew told the man that he could not open the shop. He's like, no, we're not opening this shop, dude, which made this man just furious. He's like, look, I wanted to open this shop with you, and now we can't. Like, this pisses me off. They argued back and forth for a while before Andrew shut his door in his face and the man ultimately left. Multiple policemen were then said to have interviewed Lizzie Borden after the murders and noticed her behavior was said to have been rather odd and bizarre. She was said to have had a very calm and quiet demeanor and her parents had just been killed so it's just why would you have that? And while she was talking to the officers at one point she did start to get snippy and have an attitude with them. Lizzie said was constantly ref said was said to have constantly referred to her stepmother Abby as that woman or her stepmother even though Abby was said to have helped raise her like that's just like I said that's just so disrespectful and 
was, like I said, Abby had raised her and her sisters as if they were her own, and it's just wrong. After being in, also while being interviewed, none of the investigators really noticed if Lizzie's clothing were covered in blood, which is super bizarre, because if someone had been bludgeoned with an axe, wouldn't you think that, you know, you would look for someone who was covered in blood? They didn't even notice if she was or not. After being interviewed briefly, she was said to have just excused herself momentarily and was like, I'm going to go take a nap. So she went up to her room and took a nap. Very weird. And the authorities actually let her do this. Instead of getting more details about the murder, they were like, okay, well, we're just going to let her go and nap. All right. So it was also said about while being interviewed about the murders, Lizzie's story about what happened would constantly change she would say you know at one point she claimed that she was in the barn with these pigeons that she left and grabbed several pairs before going back to the barn and the authorities right away they questioned the story because it literally made no sense i mean seriously who's because they were like you spent several hours in this barn eating pears i mean pears are good and everything but who the hell spends several hours in a goddamn barn eating pears like that shit made no sense Additionally, it was also said that it was extremely hot that day. It was August 4th. So you're sitting there in a barn that's probably really hot as well, eating some pears in the middle of August. Like, okay, Lizzie. Made no sense. It really didn't. In the basement of the Borden house, there was a hatchet that was discovered alongside of two axes. The assistant marshal of the police department believed that the hatchets were the murder weapons that were used to kill the Bordens. The Bordens. I mean, it's quite possible that the hatchet was, in fact, the murder weapon. But, of course, at this point, no one is certain whether or not it was. As the police look around in the basement, they notice that it's just covered with some, this type of, like, ashy, you know, dusty-looking substance. And they're like, hmm, what is this, you know? Once they finished looking around, the authorities began to believe that everything just seemed too perfect at this point. And it just didn't make any sense to anybody at this time. There was ultimately a medical examiner called to the scene to look at the bodies before a viewing was arranged. This viewing was said to have occurred on the family's dining room table, which seems extremely disrespectful in my, in my opinion. I mean, like, you just had your parents just be murdered. And then you decide that you're just going to go and lay their bodies on the dining room table. Like, that shit makes no sense. It was like Lizzie could have cared less that her parents were deceased, which is just super strange behavior. Lizzie's elder sister named Emma Borden was said to have come into the home around 5.30 p.m. that evening that the bodies were found. People of Fall River were scared for the safety of their sisters as they realized they believed that... You know, they needed protected since this killer was still out there and never been caught. It's possible since they killed the parents, they could come back and kill the sisters as well. So, as they searched the home, the only thing worth, report worth reporting that they found was that the sisters were in the basement. You know, they, the officer noticed that the sisters were in the basement. There was a bathroom down the basement, which they possibly could have just been using the toilet, but the off the police at this time they just assumed that you know why the fuck are they down in the basement it just makes no damn sense so the very next day emma and lizzie were said to inherited their father's money ultimately passed and they ultimately posted a five thousand dollar reward to capture their parents killer this is important to remember because if lizzie was in fact the person that murdered her family why would she ask for a five thousand dollar like, offer a $5,000 reward if she was in it for the money, you know? If you were, in fact, you know, trying to get money from your parents by killing them, why would you want to get rid of it? Like, you know what I mean? It just doesn't make any sense. On August 6th of 1892, there was ultimately a funeral for both Abby and Andrew Borden. This funeral was said to have occurred in the Borden family home inside the living room, which was the exact room that Andrew Borden was said to have been bludgeoned in. After the funeral, the bodies were not immediately buried and were said to have just been left in the living room just lying there. That's Imagine just going, like, 
I ain't trying, I'm not even like trying to joke about it, I'm being serious. Imagine just like walking down the steps and you just see your parents just still live, like lying there dead and you're like, oh, okay. And you continue on with your day, like that's just so weird to me. There was another search of the house and the axe was ultimately sent away to the local police station for analysis. Nothing significant was found as DNA evidence, at least as well as DNA had been back then, like all they could really get was fingerprints. But it became extremely obvious at this point that Lizzie was a suspect. The first person to be arrested and questioned about the crime was a man who was an immigrant from Portugal. Portugal is, it's a um, country that's, I believe, next to Spain. So he came here to America from Portugal. And back then, you know, people really frowned upon, you know, immigration and it it's, it was considered at the time if anyone who was an immigrant had to have been a suspect about this murder or this or any type of murders or any type of crimes. You know, like, oh, you know, they're not from this country, so it has to be them. You know, it's ba that's basically how it was back then. The first person, like I said, that was the first person to get arrested. And this p man from Portugal was said to have actually worked for the Borden family. This unnamed man had reportedly begged for Andrew to pay him. He's like, look, I'm working for you. You better damn well pay me. And Andrew was like, nah, fam, I'm not going to pay you. So he was saying, you know, I can't pay you. I just don't have the money, which we know is a goddamn lie because he was wealthy as hell. You know, he just had money falling out of his ears at this point, you know. So he was obviously a cheapskate and he would not pay his employees very well so it's possible that this could be a motive for wanting to have him killed according to the local authorities they claimed that if they, that there was just no way that a woman could possibly have been behind the murders because you know back then women were considered to be like precious and you know fragile and all that stuff so uh they also believe that lizzie definitely could not have been behind the murders because she was a sunday school teacher and Anyone who worked for the Lord or anything like that could not have been a person who could have done a crime like this, which it blows my mind because there's priests being like arrested all the time for molesting children. So, I mean, hey, whatever. However, it soon became increasingly obvious that Lizzie was in fact a suspect as she was being asked about this crime constantly her story just kept changing you know she'd say i was eating pears in the barn until i was over here with a friend it was just so suspicious to the authorities at the time and this was when lizzie decided hey you know maybe i should just start mentioning like this note that abby had left behind you know let me just talk about this note so she let the authorities know that she believed that this note that had been found was possible evidence that could be connected to the murders. The police searched the, over the house over and over again to find the supposed note, but they could not find anything. Even though Lizzie had just lost both of her parents, it was said that she was just extremely calm and she did not seem to be very upset about the deaths. I would say, honestly, at first, like, mm, that's suspicious that she's not upset, but, I mean, grief... And shock can affect people in different ways. You know, someone could be crying because their parents were killed. Someone else could just be numb with pain and just not really understand or comprehend that it happened. They'd just be like, okay. You know, like they don't want to believe it. Could They could be in denial. They could just, like I said, they could just be feeling numb. A pharmacist would speak up later at the trial about Lizzie, and his name was said to have been Eli Bentz. He claimed that he worked for a local drugstore in the area, and he came forward to authorities with extremely important information. On August 3rd of 1892, the day before the murders, a woman had entered his store and demanded to buy some acid. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I've never, like, gone into a drugstore and asked for acid. Like, that's just, it's so bizarre. The doctor obviously declined this sale as he believed it was extremely suspicious that this person was asking for acid. And the unknown woman just left his store empty-handed. Empty, empty I can't talk today, y'all. This doctor later claimed that this unknown woman was, in fact, Lizzie Borden herself. And it's possible that she had been poisoning her entire family. But if she was poisoning her entire family, why would she poison herself as well? 
Remember, because she was getting violently sick with her parents. It just, it doesn't make any sense. There was a coroner's inquest that was done. And for this inquest, Lizzie actually used her family's personal lawyer. When she brought her loyal, loyal, lawyer, good lord, to the trial, this man was obviously dismissed due to privacy reasons and the fact that he knew the family personally, it could be used as, um, ooh, what's that word? Ooh. The testimony could be thrown out because he knew them personally and it could be used as, you know, uh, there's a word for it. I can't think of it off the top of my head. So at the court hearing, her testimony that she provided them with was said to have been extremely bizarre. And I'm not sure what all she had said, but it said that it was, in fact, weird. The attorney then provided some pretty brutal and graphic information about the murders. And mentioning how even their brain matter had just been splattered all over the walls. Like, uh, uh, like oh my god. I know I'm supposed to be serious about it because it's, it's just... That's disgusting. It really is gross. And it's also said that Andrew Borden had been hit so powerfully that his eyeball was said to have been hanging out of his head. Ugh. So when hearing about this, it said that Lizzie covered her face with both hands because she was in shock and she was just so upset. But this was considered to be suspicious. Like, oh, she's guilty. She's covering up her face because she's ashamed of what she had done. But at the same time, I don't, it could, she could have been crying. You never know, you know, it, I don't know. So when asked about the murders, you know, Lizzie's answers were said to have been all, extremely all over the place. It stated she had actually been given morphine before the trial by a doctor to help her with questioning because she had been just so distraught about what had happened. Lizzie was said to have just flat out denied that she was the one behind it and she said that, you know, I'm not, I was not this woman in the pharmacy. I was never in the pharmacy that day. You cannot prove that was me. It could have been someone who just looks similar to me. It just doesn't make any sense. And she didn't even know about any hatchets that had been found on her property. When asked about by the authorities about the bloody hatchet, Lizzie had explained that these, ha these had been used to be kill the pigeons by her father. Because remember, she was really distraught that she had her little pigeon friends, then her dad went batshit crazy and hacked them all with this hatchet, remember? So that, that makes sense, you know? Despite all of this, she knew she was the prime suspect in the case. I mean, she knew at this point that they were all looking at her. And she was arrested on August 11th of 1892. She entered a not guilty plea at the court and was placed in temporary jail, like a holding cell. The judge in Fall River claimed that Lizzie was probably guilty like possibly but we don't really know so she might be guilty all right so he told her that she was to face a grand jury as lizzie was being charged with two counts of murder it said that she remained silent and emotionless during this time and ultimately for and is ultimately formally accused with her parents murder Murders on uh, December 2nd of 1892. That's a hell of a lot of time to be sitting in the jail cell. Her trial began six months later on June 5th of 1893 after she had been inside that temporary holding cell for only six months. The prosecution brought up Lizzie's bad personal relationship that she had with Abby Borden. Lizzie was very upset that her father had married this woman named Abby. And she was just like, why would you do that? So this could have been used as a possible motive since she felt like, you know, Abby was trying to replace her mother by being the stepmother. It's also said, this allegedly, that there was a very dark secret in the Borden household that Andrew Borden had R-A-P-E-D his daughter Lizzie and fondled his other daughter. Now, this is just alleged information. This is cannot be 100% proven. But if this was a fact, this could be used as a motive for Lizzie, you know, going off the deep end and killing her parents. The blue dress that Lizzie had claimed to be wearing that day was entirely different than the one that she had found as evidence. 
It was also stated by the prosecutor that Lizzie may have had a very difficult relationship with her stepfather, stepmother, Abby. Along with this information and the dark rumor about the S.A., you know, this could very well be used as motives for murder. And especially, like, it, it also said that they were in a... Like, her father was trying to provoke, you know, incestuous relationships. Like, a relationship between her, him and Lizzie and... <laughs> like, that's just... Oh, so gross. Additionally, you know, like I said, the prosecutor brought up that no one in the house other than Lizzie would have had a motive to go and kill the, his parent, her parents. The defense replied that Lizzie loved the Lord and would never do such a thing like this and it was completely out of her character as she was a Sunday school teacher. They grew up, you know, in Catholic religions and Christian religions, thou shall not kill, and they brought that up in the trial. She also, they also claimed that there was no real pieces of evidence that could link Lizzie to the murders other than the fact that, you know, her father was rumored to have SA'd her and her sister and there was possibly an incestuous relationship and the fact that he had bludgeoned her pigeons, you know. That's just, doesn't. it's not enough there to say, you know, like she was the one behind it. So, if Lizzie did, in fact, hate her stepmother as much as it's saying that she did, possibly, you know, assuming the abuse between Lizzie and Andrew had never occurred, why would she kill Andrew as well? And it's possible that these were all just rumors and maybe Lizzie was just a mentally ill woman and she just, you know, lost her mind one day and just killed her parents. And this could have, and it's also said that the hatchet had been in fact broken. So if she was full of rage for being a mentally ill woman, like she could have attacked them so hard that the hatchet did in fact break. Or like I said, when they brought up the abuse thing, she could have been so upset about the abuse being covered up by, by her family that she was so angry and just, you know, hacked, hacked, hacked. But again, that's just alleged information. This was brought forward about the broken hatchet because the handle had been in fact broken off and was just drenched in blood. This information about the hatchet really stunned all the attorneys in court because they had no prior acknowledgement that there was in fact a hatchet that had been discovered at the crime scene. And I find this extremely bizarre because if this was the legit murder weapon and it was, you know, brought up Previously, since Andrew Borden used his hatchet to slaughter the pigeons, why was this just now being brought up in the trial? Like, oh, that's the murder weapon. They just discovered, oh my gosh, you know, could be a thing. It, it blows my mind that they really didn't put two and two together at this point. So, the prosecution called John Fleet to the stand to testify he's uh, Uncle John, I believe. And this was the brother of Sarah Borden, they got his names kind of messed up if it was Morse or Fleet. They aren't 100% sure. So, when the pigeons were brought up at the trial, uh, John was said to have no knowledge of this having, had no idea that Andrew went batshit crazy and killed the pigeons with a hatchet. And he had no idea about the family secret as well and just had no idea about any of this going on. The police traveled back to the home in, in hopes to find the handle that had been broken off of the hatchet. But whenever they arrive there, Emma Borden is standing inside the home and she will not let anybody inside. On the night of the murders, Lizzie's friend named Alice decided to pay her a visit. So, according to Alice, Lizzie had been frantically just freaking out that someone was going to burn her house down and was absolutely terrified. One thing that had me curious was if Lizzie was scared that they were going to die, why would she butcher them with an axe? And if she just kept repeatedly saying, you know, we're all going to die, we're being poisoned, someone doesn't like us, yet she supposedly took a hatchet and killed them all? Like, what? <laughs> what? 
Alice claimed that on August 7th of 1892, she arrived at the boarding household and entered the kitchen. She recalled noticing that Lizzie was just violently shredding the dress that she had been wearing, claiming to Alice that the dress was stained. Something that's even more bizarre was that when the authorities arrived at the home to investigate, Lizzie had shown them a completely different dress. It was said that Alice never really mentioned anything about this incident until being at the trial, but Emma refused to believe that Lizzie would be the one to kill her parents. They were just like, no, it couldn't have been Lizzie. So Alice, she had found the dress in the laundry room that day, and she, was, she said that she was the one that told Lizzie to take care of it as she had not worn the dress in a long time. One thing I thought about was, like, if the dress was, in fact, in the household prior when the police were searching, wouldn't they have found it earlier? Like, maybe they were hiding it? I don't know. The whole dress thing just makes zero sense to me. Like, how they even connected it. it I don't know. At the trial that day, it was said that when the prosecutors brought up the site of the, like, brought out the site of the crime scene photos, it's just... Everyone's minds were just blown and everyone was just quiet. A lot of people still to this day find it to be quite bizarre that, you know, Lizzie did in fact, well this is allegedly, whenever they brought out the crime scene photos, Lizzie apparently just like fell over, collapsed, and passed out. And a lot of people found this to be quite bizarre because, you know, they thought that she was faking it. And I cannot for a fact say that she was in fact faking it or not. But she may have possibly just been in shock about seeing the pictures of her parents there. So what I also did find to be bizarre was that the court would not allow Lizzie's inquest to be used in trial. Like, it doesn't make any sense. The coroner's inquest. That's what I'm talking about. So on June 20th of 1893, the jury was dismissed from the court and an hour and a half later, they returned with an official verdict. Are y'all ready for this? Lizzie Andrew Borden was found not guilty of the murders of Andrew and Abby Borden. Even though Lizzie had been found not guilty, some still consider her to be the murderer, the murderer and the one behind the Borden Axe murder case. The case was ultimately closed in 1893 with no suspect in prison for the crime and it still remains closed to this day since the authorities were said to have not want to spend a lot of time on this crime. They just like, you know, want to get rid of it, wanted to call it a day, close it, and just move on with their lives. <coughs> Another odd thing is that when it came to this case, Lizzie was said to not have even been put on the stand at the, to even testify or anything like that. So it's extremely bizarre, you know. Many had claimed Lizzie was abused, like I said, abused, growing up by her father, you know, both physically and sexually. So, and even though, like, it said that Abby knew about what was going on, like, she encouraged it and she didn't do anything to stop it. Like I said, those are possible motives right there for murder if she did, in fact, do this. And it's possible that she just did not want to protect her daughters from Andrew. She was just like, you know what, I love him. I don't want to do this. You know, just screw all y'all. I'm standing by my man, which had to have been just so horrible for the sisters to have to deal with. So, um... There were said to have been some rumors that Lizzie was actually considered to be a lesbian and was in a relationship with the maid named Bridget, which back then, you know, it still has never been proven whether or not she was in this LGBT relationship with Bridget. But back then, you know, in the 19th century, and sometimes even now, it's frowned upon to be, you know, a lesbian and be in a relationship with you know, a woman or a man. So it's possible that, you know, Bridget herself was the murderer of Andrew and Abby Borden because she was the one, you know, with the really in the relationship and she was being treated like crap the whole time by um, Andrew and his wife, Abby. And she could have just lost her temper one day, took an ax and just killed everyone. But she didn't kill Lizzie because she wasn't there at the time or whatever may have been the case. 
So, I mean, people can only take so much before they snap. I brought this up, you know, with the Columbine shootings. They were bullied to the point where they just snapped and killed everybody. I'm not at all saying this is an excuse for murder whatsoever. I'm just saying, like, this, it could have happened that if the maid was, in fact, the one behind the murders, she could have been treated like shit to the point where she just, you know, I've had enough, whack. You know, it just, it makes sense. A very interesting fact about this case is that um, a very famous YouTube channel called Sam and Colby, I will link, link this video down below. I love Sam and Colby. They're like one of my favorite YouTubers. I've been watching them for like four years. And they actually traveled to the Lizzie Borden house to do an investigation with a legit psychic who can see and speak to spirits. I've told you before, I can see them. I can speak to them. But she was there and the first thing she said was, you know, Lizzie Borden wasn't the murderer. Like, right off the bat. And everyone was like, what? So, it's quite possible, you know, that she was innocent and it's possible that this John uh, Morse guy, Morse, whatever his name was, could have been the one behind the murders as he was staying there overnight and he left. No one heard him leave. No one saw him leave. And it's possible that he could have done this to the family. It's also a possibility that if he was the one, or if Bridget was the one, that money had been involved and was, you know, the reason behind the murders. As always, you know, I would love to know what you guys think about this case. Do you guys think it was the maid? Do you think it was Lizzie? Do you think it was the John Morse guy? Or do you think it was a whole other guy altogether? Do you think that this... Lizzie Borden murders could have been from someone who hated Andrew. Possibly even could have been that uh, traveling axe murderer, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul Moore? I, I talked about the Velisca axe murder video. And he was said to have traveled on trains and he would axe people to death. And just hop back on. And it's possible that he could have done this to the Bordens. Of course, none of this is you know, verified, this is just all theories and, you know, ideas of what could have possibly happened. Like I said, I would love to know what you guys think about it. Let me know down below in the comment section what you guys think about it, if she's guilty, not guilty, who do you guys think could have been behind it, what do you guys think about the maid, could she have been involved, and don't forget to like this video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so that you never miss a video I post on Tuesdays and Fridays with my vintage cases on Fridays. And I hope to see you all in my next video. Hope you've all enjoyed this one. I'll see you next time.